Okay, I think we are live. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jet. I'm the workshops director at NUS Statistics Society and uh, welcome to our second workshop of this semester. So today uh, we will be covering applied machine learning with face mask detection. So from image augmentation to transfer learning, apply machine learning from model training to integration from the comfort of your laptop's camera. This workshop is presented to you by Rama and Georgi who are on the left of the screen here. So we will begin in five minutes around 6.35 p.m. So in the meantime, uh, let's just uh, have some casual chit chat. Lah. So may I know from the audience, uh, fellow friends, <laughs> may I know what is your experience in machine learning? Uh, let us know in the YouTube chat. Uh, have you taken a few courses yet? Uh, or like if you are just interested to find out more about machine learning, or you just want to set up your own face mask detector on your laptop's camera. Let's find out more about machine learning. Or you just want to set up. Yeah. Okay, so we will start in at 6.35. Uh, Yeah, that's from uh, Silicon Valley, right? The TV series. Rama and Georgie, have you all watched uh, Silicon Valley before? No. Just some scenes on YouTube only. Yeah, so it's a TV series. It's a very interesting uh, show that uh, talks about, um, that, that illustrates certain very unique um, happenings in Silicon Valley in the tech uh, field. So, um, yeah, good to know. Um, just interested, interested, uh, Huli, yeah, Huli. <laughs> Huli is the, one of the big companies in, 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 in featured in the uh, Silicon Valley TV series. So, uh, what is the general distribution of faculties, our audience, uh, you guys? Where, where are you guys from? What kind of faculties are you from? Um, if you're not a student, uh, what industry are you from? Or perhaps uh, what kind of projects are you working on right now? Maybe you can share with us. Singapore's Galvin Belson. I will watch the latest series. Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what faculties are you all from? Hmm, science, computing. I am computer, okay. Um, engine soc info security i remember looking at the uh the sign up form and there were some from F oh yeah fass that's nice uh faculty of computing okay okay all right so um we have about two minutes left so um let's ask our presenter some questions to kick off some kind of activities you can share about yours as well in the chat uh so these questions yeah, they might not be the most interesting, but um, yeah, uh, Rama and Georgie. So what kind of um, books are you reading recently? Uh, yeah, maybe Georgie can, can share with us what kind of books he's been reading recently. Um, Books-wise, not much, but I read a lot of Medium articles. Um, but books, um, I'm not sure if you of this, but there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel uh -huh. Kahneman. It goes into two systems of thinking. Uh. One is like the fast, like reflex system, and the other one is the more, uh, more slower pace, but it's better for more computational tasks uh, in the brain. And he dives into cognitive biases and things like that in the realm of behavioral psychology, which I appreciate a lot. So that kind of like sparked my interest to learn more about the topic. Uh, I didn't read it recently, uh, but that was like I guess the last book I read. <laughs> I see, I see. That's that's a very interesting book. Um, I've also uh, read it uh, a little bit. I haven't finished it. Um, yeah, but it talks about the, uh, what's that called? The two parts of the, they call it, he called it two parts of the brain, right? One uh, one thinking fast, the other one thinking slow. The well, slow one is more for analytical. The fast one yeah. is more on reflex. What about you, Rama? What books have you been reading recently? Um, a book I read recently was When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanyi. And it's actually a book um, written by a neurosurgeon and he documented his journey going through uh, cancer. So yeah, it was quite an interesting book to find out what it's like from a perspective of a patient. Yeah, yeah definitely, I agree with that. Uh, I, I personally also read that book uh, myself. Um, it's a very uh, impactful book. 
uh, I recommend everyone to read it if you haven't. Uh, yeah, so now it is 6.35. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, let's begin with the workshop. Okay, so let me first introduce NUS Statistics Society to you. Uh, we are under the NUS Department of Statistics and Pro Applied Probability, and we are committed to foster a community passionate about uh, statistics, data science and analytics, uh, machine learning, and even quantitative finance. But we are open to all students of any background, experience, and interests. So do stay connected with us and see what ways we can work together. Let me introduce our upcoming events. You can keep in touch with us in the following uh, social channels here below. Our workshops website is where you can find resources of all past workshops, slides, recordings, upcoming workshops for semester two, etc., including uh, this particular workshop. So our Telegram chat is where you can talk about all things under the sun, uh, including uh, like as relevant topics, of course. Our Instagram is a place for broadcasting events, memes, and statistical musings. Do check us out there. LinkedIn for serious content. And finally, our email, if you'd like to connect and collaborate with us. So we organize many activities, events, and workshops throughout the entire year. The most uh, upcoming events are Firstly, a summer of data internship uh, discussion. We have a senior sharing from uh, uh, an NUS economics graduate and regional data science at Ninja Van, a business and CS senior who did uh, a business intelligence internship at DBS Bank, and another uh, data science senior who did a data science internship at MSD. So uh, in this summer of data internship discussion, we discuss what's the difference between all these various data roles. How can you get a data analyst, data science, or business intelligence offer? And if you have any questions that you might want to ask them personally, uh, you can ask them as well. So this is conducted next week, Tuesday. So do sign up. The link is uh, here. Um, so our next workshop will be next month, 15th of October all about principal component analysis or PCA, theory, algorithm, and applications. So PCA is a dimensionality reduction method. Uh, big data is ever prominent in this decade as we know. So how do we make sense of such high dimensional, multivariate, huge amounts of data? Uh, dimensionality reduction helps us harvest insights from big data. So in this workshop, uh, we employ a three-pronged approach. First, we go through the theory behind basic statistics and linear algebra concepts. Then we cover the PCA algorithm, followed by various applications that can be used with PCA from the fields of machine learning, financial analysis, psychology, and biology. So if I haven't caught your attention yet, this workshop is presented by Ming Liang, Yi and Peng, who are majoring in computational biology, data science analytics, and quantitative finance. So this workshop is really uh, one to look out for because it is presented by the most diverse members of the workshop team. And from this workshop, you can learn that methods such as PCA transcends disciplines. We will release registration on our social channel, so do follow us there. So we recently conducted the SQL for Data Science Workshops 101 and 102, and today we'll be having the Applied Machine Learning for Face Mask Detection Workshop and the upcoming one will be all about PCA. So this workshop will be recorded and slides are available on our workshop's website here. And you can access the video on this same uh, stream link. All right, let's begin the workshop finally. Uh, first off, introducing our workshop team. I'm Jet New, the director of workshops team at NUS Statistics Society. We have here Ming Liang, Yi Zhe, and Peng who are presenting the PCA workshop. Uh, we have Michael Ng, Michael Yang, and Agatha, who presented in the SQL for Data Science workshops two weeks ago. And finally, our presenters for today. Uh, Georgie and Rama are both majoring in computer science. Rama is interested in machine learning and its applications such as uh, medicine. Georgie is passionate about scalable machine learning, distributed systems, and building full-stack applications. So this workshop has been a very ambitious one as we aim to combine theory and practice, uh, which resulted in some compromise in both and huge workload uh, for us. So we hope that if you have any questions, right, do feel free to ask us on the chat because uh, this is how we make up for uh, the lack of physical uh, workshops, right? Uh, and we host it online. So uh, do, do ask us questions on the chat and we 
us, uh, the presenters, and our friendly workshops team members and members of Statistics Society will help you out. Uh, so let me now pass the time to Rama and Georgie, who will bring you through today's workshop. Yeah. Uh, Rama, can you share your screen, uh, full screen? Okay. Uh, Rama, uh, sorry, uh, you are muted at the moment. You need to unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Chet. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. So today we'll first start out with the initial steps we took when we obtain our data, followed by the creation of the deep learning space detection model, and finally, how we can deploy this model online and integrate it with your laptop camera. So the first step in a data science project is to collect and process our data. So what does this entail? Firstly, we perform data cleaning, where we detect incomplete, incorrect, or irrelevant data and then we delete, modify out all these cases. Next, we perform instance selection sometimes when our data, original data set is really huge and we want to identify a small subset that's more man manageable to deal with. Um, we then perform data normalization, which is a way to adjust all the numerical data in our data set to a common scale while still retaining the characteristics of our original data distribution. And finally, we, we do data transformation where we convert the data into different formats as required. So for our case, what we'll be doing is converting the image data into numerical data so that the computer can understand and process it. So what can we find all the data? There are actually many sources of data online that are open source, such as Kaggle, Amazon, or government websites. And you can find the links to all of these in our slides. So the data we'll be using is an open source data set from GitHub which has images of people wearing masks and not wearing masks. So the next thing we need to do is data annotation. This is basically giving our data labels and it's especially important when we're doing supervised machine learning, which is what we will be doing today. So supervised machine learning is a process where the computer forms associations between inputs and outputs. And the machine learns these associations based on input-output pairs that we provide to it. And this is why our input training data needs to have labels that tell the machine what the correct output is for each input. So that when the machine encounters a new chunk of data, it can turn out the label output based on what it has previously learned. And in our project, the data annotation we will be doing is classifying and labeling whether an image is considered as a person wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. Yeah. So, before we start to use our data to create our model, we first need to understand what exactly is involved in our data. And it's called exploratory data analysis, where we analyze our data and summarize the key features of it. So one thing we can do is sampling of our data set to get an idea of the kind of images that we have in our data set. And another thing we can do is also to check for class imbalance which is basically checking whether the data, all the classes in a data set have an equal proportion of images. And this is important because if you have imbalanced data, you will end up with a model that's biased and you will not have a high accuracy when predicting the minority classes compared to the majority classes. And for our data set, the classes are balanced with around 700 images per class. So now uh, we can try whatever we have just discussed on a Jupyter notebook. So we first need to open our Jupyter notebook and we can do that using terminal. Um, so firstly, uh, we can go into the directory that contains the files that we have for today's workshop. And you can do that by typing cd space mask dash workshop. And within this folder, we have to go into the notebook folder. And you can do that by typing 
CD dash, uh, no, C space number. And now, you can see like this notebook and a new browser will open up where you can find the notebook. So you just click on this link and the again notebook. So we will doing some data transformation and accuracy data analysis. But before that, we first need to import a couple of libraries and packages. So you can scroll down to this cell and run it. And you can run the cell by simultaneously clicking shift and enter. And this will take a while. So the main packages will be using will be Keras for building a model, NumPy for uh, dealing with the arrays, and then Matplotlib for visualization. So in the next two cells, we will be performing some data transformation and pre-processing. If you're currently in our data set folder, you can find two subfolders of images for training data and testing data. And let me explain why we need a separate data for training and testing. So the training data is what is fed into the model during training, and the testing data is used to evaluate how well the model performed uh, based on what it has learned. And since the model has not seen the testing set before while it was being trained, the testing set is thus a good indicator of how well the model has learned. So we can start out with the code, and we can run this cell. And what we're doing first is to define the file path of the training data set folder. And then what we're doing here is to obtain the file path of each individual image. So for that, we have a file called train CSV, which contains the file name of each image. And what we're doing is putting it into a data frame so that we can then iterate through the data frame to create the file path of each image using the file name. So if you run the next cell, you can see that um, the data frame we just created has one column with the names of all the files. The second column has a class, which is the label of each file. And lastly, the file path of each image so that we can use it later on to open the image. So in the next cell, so you can run the cell. And what we have is, what we're doing is the data transformation where we are converting the images into numerical values. So first, we are loading the images in based on the file path that we had just created. And the image to array function then converts these images into numerical numerical values. Um, so, it will, so now each image will have an array with numbers. And what we are doing next is to put all these individual areas into one big main array, which is the chain images area. Yeah. So next, uh, we will be creating an array of the labels that correspond to each image that we had just uh, processed. So um, how we would do this is by checking if each checking the data label of each image. And if the class says um, with mask, we would label it, we would give it a certain label. And if it says without mask, we would give it a different label, as you can see here. And you can notice that each data label itself is an array that's composed of two individual values. So basically, the first value corresponds to the probability that the person in the image is wearing a mask. And the second label corresponds to the probability that the person in the image is not wearing a mask, which is why for the image that's classified as with mask, we have one first followed by zero. And for images without mask, it's zero first and then one. Yeah. And then we are just appending all of these individual areas into a main array called chain labels area. Yeah. So uh, next. Uh, we'll be repeating this entire process for the testing data set, where we first obtain the file path of the images, and then convert the images into arrays, and then create the arrays of the image array and the label array. You can go ahead and run that cell. Hey, Rama, uh, so sorry to interrupt. Could you uh, increase the font size for the 
um, the windows, please. Thanks a lot. It's better. I hope you all can see it. Okay, so um, now if you run the cell below 1.1, you can see how the the array, the images look like once they have been converted to a numerical form. Yeah. So, yeah. Next, we will be doing some exploratory data analysis that I had just elaborated on. So the code here, we're doing sampling first. And the code here generates a random sample of 20 numbers between 0 and the number of images in our training data. And what we're doing is to open 20 random images from our training data set. And you can run this cell multiple times, and you will get a different output at each, each time you run it. And you can look through the different image, images that we have to get an idea of the kind of data that we are dealing with. Yeah. And se secondly, we have to check for class imbalance. So what we're doing is counting the number of um, images that are labeled as with mask and without mask, and summing up the total number from both the training and the testing data set. And then after we get the final number of each the final number of each type of image, we will then plot a bar chart to visualize this. And as we can see, the number of images are uh, equal for both classes. Yep. So in our case, we managed to have the same number of images for both classes, with mask and without mask. But in the real world, this may not be the case where we typically suffer from a lack of data for perhaps a certain type of class of images. So for example, you want to classify whether a cat is wearing a hat or is not wearing a hat. So it would probably be quite hard to find images of cats wearing hats um, in the real world, right? So the solution to this problem would be synthetic data generation, which is what Georgie will now be covering. So I'll pass the time over to Georgie, who will continue with synthetic data generation. Okay, am I live? Oh, okay, seems like I am. Okay, uh, thanks Rama. Well, to solve class imbalances or lack of available big data, we can use something called synthetic gener data generation. Uh, here, as the name suggests, we algorithmically generate our own data to counteract the lack of existing available data. Um, by algorithmically, what I mean is we do it automatically based on a set of predefined rules. Um, for instance, in our face mask detection project, we didn't really have a lot of you know, pictures of people wearing masks. So what we did was synthetically generate these data by taking you know, a bunch of faces, bunch of pictures of faces, and we perform face detection on it to get like the bonding box around the face. Then uh, we overlay pictures of masks on the face automatically. And this is what we get. We get a picture of a face with a mask automatically overlaid on the, on the correct region. So this is one use case for synthetic data generation. And another use case is in anomaly de uh, detection, where we generally know what anomalies look like, but we may not have to us available anomalous data. So we algorithmically create our own based on some predefined rules. So, that was synthetic data generation that helps combat the practical issue of a lack of data leading to class imbalance. But we have another practical issue, and that is our training data may not generalize well enough to real world conditions, uh, real world conditions where our trained model will be applied. And what do I mean by this? Uh, let's take, for instance, our mass detection uh, problem, right? We have a set of photos of people wearing masks, and they're all taken face on. Uh, and they're all taken in brightly lit rooms as well. But in the real world where we apply our model, uh, we may be you know, embedding the model in like a CCTV, where it's taking a video of the traffic, you know, human traffic, for instance. And there may be rain, it might be dark, and people are all captured at an angle. So the question is, will our trained model be able to generalize well enough 
and make the correct prediction for these cases. And I'm sure you agree with me that it'll have a higher chance to do so, to predict correctly, if we somehow account for them in our training data by having some training data resemble those conditions. Um, like, you know, we have some training data of people at an angle or in a dark room, then maybe it'll generalize well enough to these real world conditions. But you know, usually we don't have like thousands of images of people in random orientation, random rotations, or random light shine day or night, or rain or no rain or snow or something like that. So what do we do then? Well, fair not. In comes image augmentation to the rescue. We just generate more data based on our existing training data with some additional stuff added to it, like rotations, skills, different lighting, and noise. And actually, Keras uh, from TensorFlow has a class called Image Data Generator that will help us do that. But first, I'm going to show you a picture that will really reinforce this idea in your head. And that's enlarging your data set. As you can see, this cat is here, right? And we apply some random rotation augmentations, and then you have a bunch of six uh, new photos to play with. So yeah. And this is exactly how to do that. Image Data Generator class from Keras. So you can take a look at the documentation for more information. Uh, but generally, we can do things like random rotation augmentation very easily. Just set the parameter rotation range, uh, zoom range, horizontal flip, vertical flip. And you'll just generate all the bunch of uh, random uh, images for us based on the rules, up, which is a rotation, zoom, or flip. So now that I've talked about how we can synthetically generate more data and how we can use our existing data and generate more data based on that data by using something known as image augmentation. I'll hand the time back to Rama, who talked about actually building the face detector model. Thanks, Georgie. We will now be talking about how we can create the deep learning model. And I'll first introduce you to the concept of transfer learning, followed by an intro to Keras, and then we will start actually building our model. So transfer learning is an approach where pre-trained mod neural network models are used as a starting point when building a model about another related task. So since these models are not being built from scratch, they already have some skill initially as the pre-trained model has already been trained on other data and has already learned some of its features. So the pre-trained model is then improved by modifying the model's architecture, for example, by adding more layers to it or by fine-tuning it, and then we fit it with our own data. Um, so this allows for rapid progress because the rate at which the model improves is much faster compared to when a new model is created from scratch. And transfer learning is especially useful when you have a small data set because the pre-trained model that you start with has already been trained on a much lar larger data set. And overall, the performance is better as well. So there are two different ways that you can perform transfer learning. The first way is feature engineering. So what you do is you load the pre-trained model without the output classification layer and then you freeze the remaining layers by making it not trainable. And finally, you add your own classification layer to the model, which you will train with our own data set. So what this allows us to do is to repurpose the knowledge that the model has learned to our specific task. The second method is fine tuning, which is very similar to feature extraction. But instead of freezing all the layers in the model, so instead of freezing all these layers, we will leave some of them unfrozen. So for example, we would freeze only this half of the model while leaving this half unfrozen. So we will also train this part of the mod these layers together with our own class together with the classifier layer. Yep. And the reason why for both methods we need to add our own classifier layer is, is so that um, the classification that the model does can be specific to our task, which is classifying whether 
an image has a person wearing a mask or without a mask. So where can we find these pre-trained models to, to use for our projects? So we can get state-of-the-art pre-trained models from a couple of places, such as TensorFlow's own uh, pre-trained models from TensorFlow Model Garden. And the model that we will be using today is a pre-trained model that's developed by Google for object detection. Yep. So now I'll be doing a quick intro to Keras before we can get started building our model. So Keras is basically a, a deep learning li library that runs on top of TensorFlow. And we'll run through a few of the main commands that it has. So the first command is model.compile that defines the optimizer, laws, and metrics to be checked. So what the role of the optimizer is to update the weight parameters of our model um, in order to minimize the loss. And the loss function that we define over here, um, it guides the optimizer to move in the right direction to, re to reach the minimum loss level. Yep. Uh, next, we have model.fit that trains the model with the data that we feed into it. So the what we um, feed into it would be the image array that we just created, as well as the labels array. And it will learn the associations between the images and the labels. Next, we have model.evaluate, which we use to test how well a model has learned by feeding it, it by feeding the test data into it. And finally, we have model.predict that predicts a category of that classifies a new input that we give it based on what the model has learned. Yep, so that uh, was an intro to Keras. And now we can head back to our Jupyter notebook to see how we can implement that in code. Okay, so. Um, uh, right now, just now we stopped over here where we checked for class imbalance. And Georgie went brought us through the data augmentation part, which you can take a look at later on. So you can just scroll down to the part number four where we are bu building our transfer learning model. So what we do first is to load the pre-trained model that we want to use. And in our case, we are using MobileNet v2, which um, was a model created by Google that was trained on the ImageNet data set, which contains more than 4 million images of varying categories. And when we load our model, you need to make sure that we set the parameter of include top to false. And what this does is excluding the classification layer, as I described earlier. Yeah. And after you have loaded the model, we need to um, make sure that we that we freeze all of the model's current layers. And we can do this by setting layer.trainable to false. And this will ensure that the weights of the pre-trained model do not get updated during our training process. Yep. So what we are doing next is constructing the head of the model. model so basically, we are adding more, more convolution layers to the neural network. It will perform more operations and transformations to our data to, to learn more features from it. And you can notice that the final layer that we're adding has, um, is a, has an output of two. And this is because our specific classification task has two possible outputs, with mask or without mask. Yep. So you can run this. Uh, what we're doing finally is to combine the base model, which is the pre-trained model that we obtained from MobileNet v2, and we're combining it with the with the other layers that we had just created to generate our entire model. So after this. Um, we, we then have to compile our model as, um, by defining the loss optimizer and metrics that we want to track during our training process. 
And finally, we will train our we will actually train our model by feeding in the data. But over here, you, you don't have to run this cell because training of the model will take very long because it will take up to 10 minutes because we uh, earlier we specified to train it for 20 epochs, which means that each epoch takes 30 seconds. So it will take a very long time to train the whole model right now. So instead of running this, what we're going to do is to give you the weights of a model which we have already run a few days ago so that you do not have to waste time uh, waiting for the model to run. So uh, assuming that you had actually run your model, you would save the model into your, uh, that, into your computer by using pickle. But we are not doing that right now as we're not running the model. We're not training the model now. So what you can instead do is to load the model that we have given you by running this cell. So what it does is it will load the model that you have downloaded from the GitHub page. And lastly, what we will do is to test the accuracy of a model using the testing data set. And for that, we're using the model.evaluate function in Keras. And you can run that, and it will take a while to run. And you, we can just wait. And as you can see, the, the accuracy is 98%, which is really good. So while the accuracy seems to be really good, we would still like to take a look at the training process that the model had just gone through in order to gain insights of how we can further improve on the training process. And to do that, we can plot the training curves of the model. So, so we will now be, I'll now be elaborating on how we can analyze the training process of the model. So we can plot the accuracy and loss curves for the, for the training and validation of the model. And over here, we'll be focusing on the validation curve because it is what represents how the model performs on new data that it has not seen. So it would be more useful to analyze that compared to analyzing the training curves. So in the training and validation accuracy graph above, we can see that, uh, we can see that um, while the number of epochs increases, the training accuracy continually increases, but the, the validation accuracy stops increasing beyond two epochs and it plateaus. So this is a signal that there's actually no point training the model beyond two epochs because the accuracy does not improve much. It, it just plateaus. Yeah, and similarly, in the last graph below, we can see that while the training loss is uh, represented by the blue line, is continually decreasing, the validation loss actually starts to increase after two epochs. And this is actually a sign of overfitting where the model has learned the training data too much to a point that it cannot perform well on new data. And we want to avoid this. So let me now elaborate a bit on what overfitting is. Overfitting is basically when all the minor details and the noise in the data are picked up by the model and hence it cannot perform well on new data. So if you take a look at the graph on top, while the general trend of the data would be a linear line, the model takes into account every single um, deviation and it comes up with a curve that is very far from, from a linear curve. And the flip side of overfitting would be underfitting, where the data is not modeled well and it's very overgeneralized. So in the graph below, you can see that while the data points represent um, a quadratic curve, what the model has come up with instead is a linear curve, which is which will give very incorrect results. So for some context, in the case of our project, overfitting would result in, for example, the model only properly classifying people who it had already seen in the training data set or for example, only classifying properly people who are wearing masks of the same color or shape as what was provided in the training data. And since the training data contained masks that were overlaid on the people and the same mask was overlaid on each person, 
this would be very bad if overfitting were to happen in our for our model. And so in the previous slide when we talked about overfitting happening um, beyond two epochs, we will want to prevent this. So how can we prevent this? Uh, we can actually prevent it by a, a way called um, by a function in Keras called the early stopping callback, which stops the training when it meets a specified condition. And this is a way to optimize it, optimize the training. So the early stopping callback is just another command that you can pass into model.fit. So what this does is that we can tell the models to stop training when the loss reaches a level below when the Okay, when the loss reaches a level below the specified threshold, or if the loss doesn't improve for a specified number of consecutive epochs. So in these cases, even if you had originally specified a larger number of epochs, the training will still stop when it meets these conditions. So in the, in the first example, uh, we are telling the model to stop training when there's no improvement of the loss for three consecutive epochs. And we do this by specifying patience equals to three, which tells the computer to have to only stop training if there's no improvement for three full epochs. And the reason why we do this is um, because often the first sign when a model doesn't improve may not be a sign of the model never improving. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the model may reach a, a short plateau or the, or the loss may even worsen before it starts to improve a lot. So this is why we allow it to have a patience of three uh, or whatever number you can specify. So it doesn't stop training immediately, but allows it only stops when there's a prolonged um, plateau that's reached. And also by default, any change in the performance measure, no matter how small or minute, will be considered as an improvement. So we will want to avoid this because an improvement of maybe 0 0.0001 wouldn't add much value to us, but the training still would not stop. So to account for this, we can specify a minimum change value for it to be considered an improvement. And we can do that by specifying the minimum delta parameter. Yep. And in the, in the next example, what we're doing is uh, specifying a baseline amount. So when the loss reaches this amount, it will stop training. Yep. So this is just uh, one way where we can improve the training process. Now we can also take a look at how we can improve the, the model itself. And we can improve the model itself by fine-tuning hyperparameters. So the point, hyperparameters are basically values that are used to control the training process. And we can set them before we start training the model. So when we change the hyperparameters, the performance also changes. So an example of a hyperparameter is the learning rate, which affects the extent by which the weights get updated at every point when it's being updated. So on, on first thought, you may think that a large learning rate may be the best because you can reach your optimal level quicker, right? But actually, it's not, that's not the case. Because a large learning rate, while it may be faster, it's, it can be less reliable as there's a risk of overshooting past the minimum loss. Okay, so basically, for learning rate, it defines how big the steps you take towards the minimum point of the loss is. So if your learning rate is continually very big, you may the, the step that you may take may completely go past the minimum learning point, the, the minimum loss. And this and we would want to avoid this. And so a low learning rate would make the training more reliable, but it would also increase the time taken for the training process as you're taking smaller baby steps towards the minimum loss. So ideally what we want to do is to start with a learning rate that's high at first, when you're still far away from the minimum loss, you can afford to take bigger steps. And as you get closer to the minimum loss, you decrease the size of your steps. So to reduce the chance of 
overshooting past the minimum loss point. Yep, so this is just one way that we can, this is just one example of the hyperparameter that, hyperparameters that we can modify to improve our model. Okay, so, so far, let's review what we have done so far. So first, we have gone through the process of how we obtain our data and how we validate our data by checking it and cleansing it. We then pre-process our data by conducting transformations and converting our images to numbers and doing image augmentation. After that, we created our actual face mask detection model using transfer learning. And then we validated its performance using to test for its accuracy and loss. And finally, we looked at ways in which we can improve both the training process as well as the model by analyzing the training curves as well as by adjusting the model's hyperparameters. So what we have left to do now is to deploy the model online. And this is what Jolly will be bringing you through. And before he, he will continue with that part, maybe we can take a short break of five minutes. So the time now is 7.16, so maybe you could come back by 7.22. Uh, thanks, Rama. Uh, so let me, uh, yeah, so while, um, so let us take a five minutes break. So right now it's 7.17 as uh, Rama has just said. So um, yeah, uh, so right now, uh, if there, if you have any questions about now that what we have gone through so far, uh, now is the time to ask. And also, um, uh, the workshop is quite long, so uh, you can take this time to take a break as well. So if any questions, uh, do ask us now so that we can address it. Yeah, so how has the workshop been so far? Has it been too fast, uh, too slow, or uh, and do you think anything needs uh, clarification? Okay, there is a question, uh, but let me share the question on the screen. So uh, someone asked, uh, how do you know which loss functions or optimizers to choose uh, when training your model? So uh, uh, Rama, do you, would you like to answer this question or uh, I can go as well? Um, maybe Jet can take the question. Okay, uh, so uh, for loss functions, it really depends on uh, the data set and as well as what kind of objectives that you want to achieve. So uh, in the case of loss functions, for example, you have um, uh, you have your mean absolute error, which uh, which is which the formula is just uh, your y value minus away uh, what your model thinks is the y value. So uh, that is mean absolute, which means just minusing, and uh, there is another one called mean square error. There is also a root mean square error. So there are all these kind of loss functions. Um, so for example, if you want to uh, uh, increase the, um, the how much the scale of the data might uh, affect uh, model prediction, you might want to use something like mean square error because squaring would help to uh, uh, increase the error, right? So, so for example, if the, if the error is, is above one, uh, uh, let's say if it's two, uh, your mean square error would increase error to four, while your mean absolute error would still be two. So um, well, that is one example of, of, of what uh, loss functions to use. So your loss functions really depend on um, uh, what you are training the model for. Uh, as for optimizers, it um, uh, I'm not too sure about this one. Um, there are some uh, general... Uh, uh, practices, uh, for example, um, in in some cases, uh, uh, Adam, which is adaptive uh, gradient, uh, would uh, perform better. But in some cases, uh, RMS prop would also uh, perform better. So, um, uh, the the type of optimizer would uh, depend on a lot of factors. Uh, but in uh, general, 
um, uh, it really depends on uh, what you are uh, training the model for. Yeah. So there was a question above uh, from Junjie that uh, so uh, for the pictures that we use uh, as input data to the uh, face mask uh, detection model, uh, do you have to first manually label all the pictures with uh, mask and not mask? So the answer to this is uh, yes, we need to manually label it. So uh, uh, at the start, this is actually a supervised learning uh, uh, model. So with that, we need truth label. So given an image, what is it truly? Uh, is it really a is it a mask or not a mask uh, image? So uh, at the start, right, uh, the data set that we source was already separated into mask and not mask. Uh, so what the original uh, data set curator, right? Uh, he augmented the data set because at the start, um, uh, before uh, the this situation of COVID, um, uh. There wasn't a lot of images on of people having masks. So what he did was image augmentation, where he just took the image of a mask uh, and then overlay on top of the face. So uh, yeah, so that is how uh, the original dataset curator uh, created the mask images. Uh, so uh, the workshop will be recorded as we all our workshop uh, uh, upcoming and past. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, do look at our workshops website, which uh, I will include in the chat below. So uh, Kat Loy asked, uh, can I, uh, which software do you use to overlay the masks on certain images? So uh, with that, um, let me go back to one of the slides. Uh, so, so this is how the original process was done. Uh, but we don't know what software he used. Uh, but what he did is he first uh, took the bounding boxes to get the face crop out of the image and then uh, did some kind of mapping to get the points of the eyes, the facial features. And then from there, then he took this uh, uh, image of a mask to overlay it over the nose and the mouth and the ear and whatsoever. Yeah. Regarding the software, I'm, I'm not too sure about it. Okay, I think it's uh, 7.23 now, so I think we can resume uh, with the next uh, part of the workshop, part two, which is on uh, how we deploy the model. Um, okay, so before that, one last question. Are there any other ways you can deal with the data set imbalance without synthetically creating the images? Uh, yep, there is a, a few ways. So one way is to do up sampling. Uh, or, uh, so let me go to this slide. Okay, so I, I don't think I have a slide, uh, but um, so for example, uh, if you have imbalanced data sets, right, uh, the smaller data set, which might be what you want to express more in the data set, uh, you might want to increase the sample of it, uh, perhaps by doing some kind of in-betweens. So um, what I mean by that, uh, so for example, you have an image um, uh, uh, of mask, an image of uh, uh, another image of masked people. So mask, the, let's, okay, sorry, let me rephrase that. So let's say you have a uh, mask, uh, you have fewer mass images than non mass images. So you want to increase up sample, the number of uh, mass uh, uh, samples. So uh, some methods are like SMOTS, so synthetic uh, minority up sampling or uh, something like that, S-M-O-T-E. I'll link it in the comments. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, resume with the second part of the workshop uh, where Georgie will bring us through how do we uh, deploy our model into a demo uh, so that we can use our camera's laptop. Uh, sorry, our laptop's camera to show <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, the performance of the model. Yeah, thanks Georgie. Thanks Jed and Rama. Uh, oh yeah, to add on to the 
synthetic data generation of software power. Because my mic was muted earlier, so I was like talking around and I realized that my mic was muted. So um, actually, they didn't really use any software. So you know the mask images, right? They probably took a mask picture, right? Uh, took a photo of it. And they cropped it out in Photoshop so that the background layer is transparent and there's only the mask. So then afterwards, they just use OpenCV, which is a Python library called Open Computer Vision to do the face detection. Um, and then from the face, they did a feature detection, like the nose, the mouth. And then they kind of just overlay, uh, combine the two images together using uh, OpenCV function. So that's how it was done. So um, now I will be talking about uh, how we actually can integrate this model into a full stack face mask detection system. Uh, start with the roadmap. Uh, here's what we will be doing. Uh, first, I will have a mystery slide for everyone. Um, then I will talk about how our project is structured. Oh yeah, by the way, you can see the GitHub uh, link that we sent earlier in the comments uh, or in the email. It's uh, You can go to bit.ly slash statsoc face mask. Uh, okay, so now I'll talk about project structure and how we manage our project dependencies. And after that, I'll talk about the design overview, like general design of how, how we design our system. And then we'll, we'll build and test it, actually build and test. Uh, actually, if you download the code from GitHub, right, the back-end code isn't complete. There's uh, some missing parts we need to fill in. So we, we don't give it, we don't give the answer to you. Uh, you have to follow us and build along. Then I'll do some conclusion on how we may improve the model and like scale it up going forward. Okay, so let's talk about the mystery slide now. Well, mystery slide, what is it? It's a sneak peek of our final product. And for that, I will show you the product in action. But I have to turn off my camera first. It may lag a little bit because I'm sharing my screen. But okay, let's just hope it works. Okay. You can see my face here. There's no mask. Okay, okay. By the way, the right side is a detection lock. So every like I think like five seconds, right? If there's if there's no mask detector, it's gonna lock my face. Look at it right here. So if I move my, my face around, right? The rounding box kind of follows my face. It's lagging a bit right now because I'm streaming, but usually it's pretty snappy. So yeah, I mean, what good is it if you can only detect no mask and just track my face, right? I mean, I may be just lying to you. It's it's just a face tracker, right? But no, actually it's more. Look, when I wear my mask, it says that I have a mask and it still tracks. And it doesn't take picture of me anymore. So that's pretty cool. So we have a few things here, right? First is the bounding box around my face. So I know we, we didn't really go through that in building the model because it's totally separate from that. And I'll talk about it later. And you can see the total detections. Uh, here we have the latest detection time, the average detection time, and things like that. So yeah, hope you found that pretty cool. So once again, right, uh, this is the GitHub repo. Okay. Once again, this is the GitHub repo. You can take a look here. The bit.ly link has been sent. Okay, so let me just go back to the presentation. All right, so hope you found that cool. Uh, now I will talk about how our project is structured and how the dependencies are managed. So from the GitHub repo, you have a root folder called Face Mask Workshop, right? And in it was a notebook that uh, Rama went through earlier. Uh, in the notebook folder, there was like the Python notebook and then the Keras model, the Keras model training history, and things like that. Um, then uh, we also have a backend folder, right, which contains our detector.py under the detector folder. And that's actually our ML model, right, the model we just built. Uh, and then there's a config folder which contains our model saved weights, which our model will be, uh, will be loading. Then after that, we have a main.py, which is our fast API server. It's the API server that is used to serve the model. So you may be wondering why we actually go to the trouble of making a fast API server and not just use Jupyter Notebook or running it in Terminal, right? And the reason for that is because when we build a model, we want to actually serve it, right? Hence the name uh, server. We want to actually serve it to, so that other devices on the web, other maybe devices in your local network can uh, use it. So, and we can't really do that in a Jupyter Notebook or Terminal. We need to expose the model to something like an API server, API layer, API server or something like that. So, okay, that's it for back end. So now we have the front end, the website itself. So web front end is whatever you can see, you can touch everything you interact with as a user. So for the front end, we have a pages folder and in it there's an index.js, which is the front page of the root component. 
And if you saw earlier, there was this camera component and the detection log. We show you like the feed of my face when it was captured. Uh, and that's actually found under components, cut video feed. That's for the for, for the displaying of the webcam and drawing the you know the bounding box around my face. And then got other stuff like cut detection log and footer content, which is the footer of our website. But we won't go into too much detail uh, about that. So then after that, we have a utility uh, class, a utility, uh, sorry, utility file named detector.js. Uh, this is just responsible for making the API requests uh, to the back end, uh, to send like the pictures to the back end so that the back end can do some processing and then uh, give us back the, the, the results. And then after that, we can you know, draw it on the face. So yeah, and lastly, we have a config.js, which is what we use to configure the application. Uh, by configure, I mean setting like the frame rate, you know, like how fast it detects the face, oh, sorry, not how fast it detects the face, but how often it sends like a frame of the webcam video to the back end for detection. So as of now, it's 200 milliseconds, uh, which hopefully will work well on everyone's computer. Uh, it worked well on my like two gigahertz, uh, 10 year old laptop. So hopefully everyone can run it properly. Um, yeah, and that's all for project structure. As for managing project dependencies, this is very important when we are doing uh, many projects, we're doing projects of various skills, uh, you definitely need to touch this. Uh, for our front end, we're using Node.js. Uh, so we are using NPM, called, which is called Node Package Manager, to set up like isolated project environments to install our dependencies in. And these dependencies are like libraries called like date parsing library and things like that, and the front end library uh, for our Node.js projects. And in the front end folder, you would find a package.json file, which contains the list of our dependencies. And when we install our dependencies, it goes into a node modules folder. More info on this can be found on the GitHub page. And this is a very standard way to manage Node.js projects. In dependencies, we can simply type npm install package name. Uh, for instance, npm install moment, which is a date parsing library. If we want to install all the dependencies specified in this file, package.json, right? We can just type npm install and you install everything. So, okay. And yeah, as for the node modules folder, uh, it looks something like this uh, under here, right? You can see all the folders that contains the dependencies. So this is for node.js, which is our front end, the website. Uh, now we move on to the back end, which is coded in Python. And for Python, we used VN to set up our isolated environment to install dependencies in, like Flask, Pandas, NumPy, TensorFlow, things you're familiar with. Um, and we use, um, VN is for the environment, and we use pip to install, we use pip to actually install the dependencies that go into the VN folder. And we specify the list of dependencies in our requirements.txt file. Uh, so this uh, pip and VN is kind of equivalent to NPM. Uh, NPM is a all-in-one tool, but for Python, you have to use both VNs and pip. So for installing dependencies, we just type pip install package name, like pip install TensorFlow. Uh, if you want to install all the dependencies specified in the requirements.txt file, you just type pip install r uh, space requirements.txt. Once again, instructions are in the GitHub page. So uh, for motivation, right? As far as possible, we want to keep our project dependencies isolated from other uh, system de global dependencies. Uh, and why is that the case? So that we can maintain separate versions per project of certain libraries like Flask or uh, Enterflow, right? So if you have a project that's using Flask version one, right? And you have another project using Flask version two, the code is uh, that you write in each project will likely be different because maybe there's a change in some function names in the Flask library. So if you are using a single version across both projects, right? Just using a global version of Flask, right? Only one of the code base will work at a time. So you need something called a, uh, you, need, you need to keep your project dependencies isolated from one another. So one project can depend on Flask version one and another can depend on Flask version two and both code will still work and you can update them independently. Uh, so next, we also want to avoid installing dependencies globally because it may break other tooling. Uh. And also, it's pretty much. And the last reason is to use because it uh, kind of helps us organize our projects better. It's more consistent with our mental model of how this project should be organized. We should tie the dependencies to the project itself. And these are just uh, VN, PIP, and Python are just tools that will help us do that. Okay, now I'll talk about the design overview. Okay, now we're getting a little bit uh, more into the the bread and butter of our project. Okay. 
Okay. So design overview. So, right, as you see, we have a front end here, right? It's pretty simple. We have a front end, which is our website, and we have a back end, which is our uh, REST API. Uh, for our front end, uh, it will just ask the back end with a picture taken from the camera, uh, camera, uh, the video frame. You ask the back end, am I wearing a mask, right? You'll send this picture over the internet via H uh, using HTTP, right? And ask the back end, am I wearing a mask? The back end will do some processing, you calling predict on the model and reply with an answer, yes or no, right? And that's about it. That's about it from a very high level overview. And once again, the front end is managed with NPM, the back end with PIP and VN, and we're using HTML, CSS, JS, and React for the website, whereas we're using Fast API for the REST API server. Once again, more details in the GitHub. Okay, and in greater detail, right, of our the actual process, uh, our front end, right, records the video of, you know, records the video, and it just sends a frame of the video every uh, 0 0.1 second or 0 0.2 seconds, depending on what you configure it to. And it sends the frame to the back end via a HTTP POST request. A uh, HTTP POST request is a request that, uh, that, that, that contains like data that wants to make a change somewhere, wants to make a change in the back end. So in our case, we are posting to the slash detect endpoint which basically just receives or just awaits uh, requests of image and then it will uh, call, it will, it, will, it will read the uploaded file and then it will call detector.predict on the file. Uh, here we name it detector.predict and not model.predict because a detector is actually a separate class we have that wraps the model because we are doing more things than just using the model to predict. We're actually doing a couple of more things. So, okay, once a backend has a file, it does predict on it gets the result in a Python dictionary, and then it returns it back to the front end or the client. Uh, actually, your front end can be a mobile website, it can be a mobile app, it can be a website, it can be anything. It returns it to the front end as a JSON file with these uh, attributes, wearing mask, uh, the confidence, and the coordinates. Uh, the coordinates is the, represents the coordinates of the bounding box around the face. So then the front end has this information. What does it do? It just draws stuff on your face based on the results. And that's our system in a nutshell. So now I'll talk a little bit about the code, right? I know you guys are here for the code as well. So I will talk about the code. So uh, the relevant pieces right here are just index, right? cut video feed, and detector.js. And I will just show you right now. Let me know in the comments if it's too small too big or if you can't see or anything. Because uh, I think, not sure on all screen sizes or mobile, this is actually visible. But just let me know uh, ASAP. Okay. So let me just zoom in first. I think it's pretty confusing if I don't. So OK. So as I mentioned, right, we have a file called cut video feed here, cut video feed. And this is the relevant code in cut video feed file. Let me just write here. This is called a card video feed dot js. Okay, so this is the relevant code from line thirty five all the way to line fifty nine. Right here, this part of the code, uh, it just gets the permission from the user to use the webcam. Right then, once the permission has granted, just do a put tip here. Permission has been granted. Uh, it will take the webcam stream, and it will set the video source object to be the webcam stream. And video source object is basically just the video element that you see on the screen that displays the video. So it'll set the stream or the source of it to be our webcam stream. And it will call play on the video. So that plays the video. So afterwards, we have a function here called start detection loop, which as the name suggests, does the detection on a loop. So we pass the video into this function called start detection loop so that it can start the detection loop on the video. So yeah, that's about it for our cut video feed.js, which is once again the file in here, right? Cut video feed here. It's within it's within this folder here. So it's under front end components cut video feed, cut video feed.js. So yeah, we're done uh, talking about that file. So now you may be wondering where is start detection loop defined? So where is this? Where, where, right? And what does it do? Well, it's actually defined in our index, right? So our index is actually here. Pages index. So 
start detection loop. This is the function. And this is the video that it takes as argument. Uh, you can ignore this line, right? So I want you to focus on this particular uh, function here called set interval. Set interval is actually a built-in JavaScript function which uh, does something on an interval. So let's say maybe you want to print uh, you want to print like hello world. Maybe you want to print hello world once every one second. So then you will call this function set interval. You put the print statement within here and you put the interval to be 1000 milliseconds. So this prints hello world every one second. So in our case, we want to run detector.detect face mask on the video every loop interval millisecond. So for this, right, uh, by default, it's configured to be 200 millisecond. So it'll run everything within here uh, once every 200 millisecond, which gives us around uh, five frames per second. So, okay. So we'll do a detection on the video, on the video frame. And then with our result here, as you can see, there's a then here. So then kind of tells us what we want to do after this is done. So after this is done, we have the data. So what do we do with the data? The data contains our results of the detection. We set our detection data to be the data here, set detection data. So we just pass in the data here, like data.results, data.logs, and we set it. We set our website, what our website knows to the new data that has been returned. So after that, we can proceed drawing the, uh, the box on the face. So I'll talk a little bit more now about just remove these lines. So now I will talk a little bit more about uh, about the actual detector dot detect face mask video right now. So where is this defined? You may be wondering. And now that leads us to our final file, which is utils dot detector js details detector.js. Okay, so let's talk about that now. So oh, what our details detector.js which is uh, here, right? It's actually responsible for uh, is, as I mentioned, communicating uh, to the back end, right? It allows our front end, our website to talk to the back end or rather contains a helper function to uh, for our front end to do so. And this helper function is actually detect face mask right here when we pass in a video, right? And this is the same thing up here, detect face mask. So these are the same. So uh, what does it do? Well, it does some processing. Okay, it does some processing here uh, to the video to get a particular snapshot of the video in time, right? A particular frame of the video. Uh, and then, right, it appends it to form data, right? Form data is just a way to uh, submit a form to website. And it does a simple post request here with the form data being the body, which is our image in our case. And where does it post to? Where does it send to? It sends to our API URL slash detect, the detect endpoint here. So that's how it kind of submits the file, submits the frame to the back end for detection by this part of the code. This part of the code is responsible for submission. You can just call it uh, responsible for submission via HTTP post, right? So this is the part of the code. Okay, so now to wrap up, we submitted something to somewhere, but where is that somewhere? So now I will talk about where it has been submitted to and what happens afterwards. So as for submission, right? So it does the, after it does the detect, the post request here, right? Post request form data is the image. Submits to this part. So where actually receives this submission? Yep, and that's in backend main.py. So uh, I know I'm jumping a lot in the uh, around here and there, but uh, I guess I that's the uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but you can take your time to read the code on your own. It's on the GitHub, but and it's all labeled, I guess. Right here, okay. It sends a post request to this uh, location slash detect, and it's our uh, backend as as a endpoint right here 
there is name slash detect as well to is who is prepared to receive these uh, requests, the uh, receive the image. So this is our backend code. Uh. It's a backend. It's in backend folder. It's the main dot py. You can't miss it because it's named main. So right. So our detect right actually just gives us a uh, post the image. So our webcam image right. We just uh, image. Uh, put the face here. Uh, right. Okay. The image gets sent HTTP post right. Okay. Our image gets sent there. Okay. And okay. So, our backend receives the image, right? It reads the file. Because our uploaded file is here. Okay. It reads the file. It does some uh, conversion of the file to byte stream. And then it opens the image using P, uh, Python pillow library. But you don't have to really worry about this too much. And it stores the image in some uh, variable called PIL image. So we have the image. What now? We need to predict using the detector and get the latest logs and the result. And here is uh, yeah the prediction code that you'll be filling in. So yeah, and once again, this is in backend main.py. Feel free to take a look uh, in your own uh, code editor. You will probably not find any completed code here. I blanked it out because I accidentally completed it and then I, well, I took a screenshot. So yeah, so that's in a nutshell how our system works. Huh? It just, uh, just runs the detection loop on the video and then at every interval, it will take a snapshot of the video frame, and then it will submit it to the backend using a HTTP post request. And our backend is ready to receive ready to receive the data by a, a endpoint named uh, the slash detect endpoint. So yeah, pretty simple. Okay, so now I go into a little bit more detail of how our backend actually processes the image. It's not just a post endpoint; does a lot more. Uh, so. Let's look. Okay. So our backend has the image. Hooray, what now? Okay, this is the image. So we have to call detector.predict image. And what does this actually do? It's actually a two step process. First step, it will have to run self dot get faces on the image. And what does this do? It does, uh, it just isolates all the faces, it gets a bounding box of all the faces. Uh, in the image uh, and sets it and, and, and returns the coordinates describing all the bounding boxes in an array. Uh, if you recall just now, we talked about the syntactic data generation, right? We're given an image, we uh, do face detection on it to get the uh, image crop, the face crop. Yeah, that's exactly the same thing that's happening here. So uh, afterwards, once we get the crop image of the face, we run uh, self.predict face mask on the crop image. So this is where our actual model is called, the model.predict. That we train, and you just done do the prediction on the crop image and return us the result. That's pretty straightforward. It's a two-step process. So let's uh, delve a little bit more in detail on how the get faces is implemented. So it's actually implemented using a uh, CV two, uh, uh, Python Open CV library, a uh, computer vision, and a few techniques actually can be used for this. One of them is a hair cascade classifier. It's a non deep learning uh, way. So it basically is uh, just takes hair features, which is uh, regions where there's like um, dim, uh, bright, dim, bright. And they will try to fit it around like your nose and your ears and your mouth where there's like regions of like very light color and then darker color to kind of try to detect where all these features are. And they will draw bounding boxes around all the features. So that's for hair cascade. And for a deep learning based model, we can also use that. Uh, there's one on cafe, there's, there's one built with cafe, uh, cafe net. And it's a cafe model running on ResNet. So that's another that's another approach we can use. So there's actually a bunch of ways, bunch of techniques we can do face detection. So yeah. And and which one to choose actually just depends on your use case, or whether you want uh, it to be super accurate or you want it to be fast. But in our case, we want sort of a real-time, real-time result. So uh, if you just try to use the deep learning one, which we are actually using, it'll be very slow. But it's not very slow for our case. Uh, and I'll show you why later. So after we do the face detection we will have to run predict face mask on the cropped face, right? Because we, in the end, we still want to know whether the person's wearing a mask or not and the confidence. Uh, we run this self.predict face mask on the crop image. So this is actually where our face mask model is used. And uh, these are some pre-processing before we actually run the model. So you can see on this line, I think it's pretty small, but it says self.model.predict face image. Yeah, and then we're just returning the first element of the result, the zeroth element of the result. So yeah, that's uh, our, uh, detector.predict. So after we get the result, right, 
our front end needs to know of the result and needs to draw the bounding box on the face given the result. So it does the draw bounding box here. It's implemented in card video feed canvas as well. So it just draws the bounding box given the coordinates, the label, and whether you're wearing a mask or not. Okay, so we've come to the actual building part. Let's build and test. I'll just get a sip of water first. Okay, so uh, right now, right, uh, I hope everyone has the GitHub repo cloned because we are going to be making some use of that. Actually, we will be making use of that. So, um, let's see. I mean, yeah, have slides. Okay, so I want uh, everyone, if you, if you want to deploy the model, right, just open up your terminal. Actually, open up three terminals uh, because we will need all of them and just go to your home folder. Uh, I'll show you which steps I am making reference to. Okay, under project and in the GitHub repo, right? Go to project setup. Uh, I know the instruction is pretty lengthy, but uh, well, I mean, it's the most foolproof way to do it and to have uh nothing like kind of break uh, because you just need to execute. You just need to copy paste commands and then like everything should work fine. So we're doing it this way. So uh, so if you go to the GitHub repo, you can just go on to running the front end, running the back end, right? So basically just clone the repo first, right? Follow this step, clone the repo. Uh, and then just try to CD into front end. I think I need to zoom in, right? Okay. Oh dear, oh shit. Uh, that's too much. Okay. So just clone the repo. Um, then uh, you can skip Jupyter Notebook because that was covered just now, okay. Then you can do CD face mask workshop, CD front end, and just do NPM install and then NPM run dev. Yeah, these, these, uh, these steps right here. So I'll, I'll walk you through the steps. Don't worry about that. So, okay. Uh, okay. So, first, I will set up the. Okay. No servers first. So if everyone has terminal open, right, you should be at your home directory and hopefully you clone the repo in your home folder. Uh, and, and if so, right, okay. First, we want to spin up the, uh, the front end server and the back end server. Uh, and you can use any editor you want to edit. But for now, we want to run, we want to install the dependencies first and then we want to run the servers. So I have a terminal open up here. I'm in my home folder. Okay, I'm going to just CD face mask dash workshop, right? It's going to go to the web. I'm going to just go into the workshop directory, and I'm in the workshop directory now, right? As you can see here, face mask workshop. Then I'm going into the front end directory. Okay. Uh, before you run anything, you must run npm install to install all the dependencies. Uh. Okay. So once again, you can use any editor, but that will be later. We only need to edit one file, so not to worry. Not not not. Don't have to worry so much. So uh, while I'm running uh, npm install here, I will just have you guys open up another terminal because we need to install the package dependencies for the backend. So, okay, I will open up another. I know it looks like I have one terminal open, but I'm just doing a split up. So if you open up another terminal, right, I believe you will be in your home directory, right? Just go into face mask again, CD face mask workshop, and just press tab to complete. And once you're in there, just CD backend. Okay, you're in the back end folder now. So once you're in the back end folder, which you can see here, okay, you can see at your terminal prompt, it says face mask workshop back end. Just run a uh, Python 3 dash M V N V N. You can copy paste the instructions in the GitHub, by the way, if you want. Just over here, right? Python 3 V N V N uh, M V N V N. Yeah. Should take a uh, pretty fast. Okay, oh it's done already. Okay. So afterwards, right? You know it's done when you see like you can type again. Afterwards, you just type source. The end been activated, which is the second instruction here. Press enter. Okay. You should see a VN uh, beside your beside your terminal cursor. Afterwards, you can type uh, pip install dash r dash uh, requirements dot txt. Okay. This is exactly the same as the GitHub. We can type that in and you should start installing everything. 
Okay, so I will quickly just jump back into the front end terminal on the left here. And I'll just run a, well, still in the front end folder, I'll just run npm run dev. So this will just spin up the server. It's uh, under here, step three, uh, step four of running the front end, just npm run dev. And you should see a uh, ready started server on localhost port 3000. So I'll wait for my back end to install. A bin is called scripts on Windows. Uh, oh yeah, we're using a WSL terminal for the demo though. So uh, it might be different on command prompt. Uh, so uh, yeah, we don't have command prompt uh, available to us. So we can't really like test for that. So once your backend has finished installing, it should take a little, a little while, uh, uh, but you should see that you can type again, right? You just clear the prompt. You should see you can type again, which is good. So once that's done, you can just write dot slash run uh, sh, which is just you know this step here, which is step six, run sh to run the fast API server. And once you type that, you can just hit enter, and it should start running. Right, started server process, application start complete, and that's how you know your server is running. So let's just jump into Chrome. Uh, I'll give everyone like a while to execute the commands. Any questions, just uh, shoot ask questions on the chat or you can post as a GitHub issue. Just wait a while. Okay. I hope uh, everyone has it, uh, both the front end and the back end running. So right now, if you go back to your Chrome, right, and you type, you go to localhost port 3000, right? Just this, I'll just paste it in here. Uh, hope the chat is place. Okay, just localhost 3000. You see yourself, uh, your, there should be a prompt that asks you whether you will allow the webcam to be used. I just just click yes. And then you should see yourself here. There is no detection, nothing yet, because we need to fix up the back end code. So let's just do that real quick. So, uh, okay, right here at the right, you can see the logs and the left can see the server. So right now, just open up another terminal because, or, or actually you can use your text editor or anything. Um, just try to go to this file here. Let's get rid of this. Okay, I'm in my home directory, right? You see, I'm in my home folder. I'll just go into the workshop directory, facemask workshop. Um, I'm in face mask workshop now. I'll just go into the back end folder. Okay, you can see I'm in the back end, right? So uh, I'll bring your attention back to the slides uh, where uh, we are in back end structures and files, slide number 60. Right, so this is our back end folder, I recall. And detector.py is where our model is. It's our, it houses the class, right, that wraps our model. And main.py is where you'll be writing the code. Uh, let me check the chat. Any recommendation on sources where to learn project setup? Yes, for Node.js, you can just search for maybe a React. Just, just Google for a React tutorial, R-E-A-C-T tutorial. And for Python, you can search for Flask or Fast API tutorial. Uh, those will teach you how to set up websites and like backend projects and things like that. And uh, inherently, you have to manage the projects using PIM or NPM. And it's a very standard process once you've you know done a few websites and got used to it. So yeah. So you write, have you write code in main.py on the back end? Okay, so I'm in, my, I'm in my terminal now, right? If you're using VS code and things like that, uh, right, don't, you, you can open, uh, you can still open the file there or anything. Just type, uh, just, just open main.py. Okay. This file right here, main.py. You should see the bunch of imports. Uh, as, uh, here we are importing PIL, we are importing detector, right? We're importing a bunch of other things, fast API, things like that. Uh, okay, if you go down to the first to do, which is on line 49, we uh, have the instruction here, ask us to initialize our detector object. And another line here is to use our detector, uh, predict using our detector and get the latest logs. So initializing our detector object is pretty simple. I just write here, detector equals to detector, right? So that, that's all. It's just a simple Python uh, object initialization syntax. Okay, we're just calling the detector's constructor here and we're assigning it to detector variable. 
So afterwards, we need to predict using the detector and get the latest logs. So um, for that, right, we may need to look a little bit into the signature of the detector.predict method. I'll just open another file here, right? Detector.py, it's under detector. Oh, you don't have to open this file if you uh, don't want to, you can just follow along. But I'll just go through, um, right? So on the left, we have main.py. On the right, we have detector.py under detector, detector.py. So uh, you can ignore this bunch of imports here. It's just importing keras and things like that. Uh, but uh, important thing to note is this line, line 81, which says predict. Predict takes in a few arguments. Uh, one is the image that you know we have to predict on. Right here on the right. And another is print logs, whether we want to print the logs or not. And it's by default, so we need to specify it to be true. So uh, predict just does this self dot get face image uh, get get underscore face on the image and then afterwards it just iterates through all the faces and then run our self dot predict face mask as was mentioned in the previous uh, slides. So these are the two key points here, line eighty five and line ninety three. But I don't really have to touch any of these. I will just go jump right into what predict returns because we need the return value of predict. What does it return? It returns results and the detection log, whether it's updated or not. So I just copy this over. Right. Results, comma, detection log updated, and we need to call predict uh, detector dot predict. Click on what? We need to pass in PIL image to be predicted on. Let's close this. And we need to set print underscore logs to be true. So just write down this line here, right? Results uh, comma detection log updated and equals to detector dot predict PIL image and print logs equals to true. Let's give you guys some time to just write that down. And then I think I will address some questions. Okay, uh, for UVCorn, uh, UVCorn is just the WSGI server. Um, right, for UVCorn, uh, I think the main issue we encountered right, in the GitHub issues is that other dependencies didn't manage to install properly. Therefore, UVCon also kind of gets blocked. So I urge you to refer to the GitHub issue on that or our setup instructions page because highly likely one of the libraries didn't manage to install properly for you and that caused the UVCon to not install properly. So if you are in the directory, right, uh, type git pull to get the latest version of everything. And you should try running the instructions again and it should uh, be able to install everything properly and UVCon should be able to be installed. As for why I'm using React, uh, that's because um, I guess I'm used to React, so I just decided to write it in React. I'm using uh, Next.js actually, so if you are interested. So yeah, okay, now back to the code. Um, don't worry if you can't follow this right now because it will be uploaded later, the correct code. So we have results and detection log updated right here. So now we need to uh, update what is being returned to the client. So it's under here, return. So just change this line, right? To results, just copy over results. As for here, just copy over detection log updated and we are done. Uh, and for this, right, just write detector. Write this detector dot get underscore logs. Okay. So what has, have we done here? We just did the prediction right on the image and set logging to be true. Uh, and then we got back the results and we got something known as detection log updated, which is just a way to tell the front end whether the images have been updated or not. Uh, and then we are trying to return these uh, variables to the client as a Python dictionary, which should be converted to JSON. So here we have results, we have detection log updated and we have detector.get underscore logs which is just a helper function to get the logs up that uh, the, the most recent logs upon this detection. Don't really have to worry too much about this. So yeah, so we, to recap, we changed line 50 to construct our object. Uh, we change line 60 to, to the prediction. And now we have returned the results of the prediction to the client. Okay, so we should be done. I'm gonna just save and quit the file. And now, if you've done everything correctly, right, the application should just reload on its own. You can just wait for this to finish. And then you'll see an info, uh, we're done loading. Uh, 
Once again, don't worry if you can't follow. We will address all the concerns on the GitHub issues page and we will kind of give you the correct code. Oh, you can see here the logs are printing, uh, time taken for detection and things like that. So I'll stop my video and I'll show you the result. As you can see, it's working now after we've plugged in the code that we need. So, so you can see it's tracking my face pretty well. And if I put on a mask, it turns up as yellow and I'm wearing a mask. Woohoo, done. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Okay. All right, so now that we've successfully built the face mask detection model, uh, sorry, the face mask detection website, integrating our model inside uh, it. I will move on to talking about how we can perhaps improve on it, right? So you can see the speech pretty fast. And if I didn't make some, you know, adjustments to the initial uh, design, it wouldn't be this fast. And I'm going to talk about that right now. So conclusion, conclusion time, uh, let's see. So what did we do, right? What did we do? We build a model, we train this model. We inserted this model as a service, we embedded it in our backend. And then we made some optimizations like cropping the face before running the image through the model. So, you know, we have a smaller image, the model will process it faster. And then finally, we saw the model working in action. So what next? What if, you know, we want to make it faster, right? We want a higher FPS throughput. We want it to maybe just, you know, just hug my face, just stick to my face when I'm just moving and not, you know, lag behind. Or what if we want it to want to make it detect more than one face, like uh, if we embed the CCTV on the streets and then we have like a few, like a dozen people just walking around. We want to detect all the faces and not have it like lag. So let's find out how. So let's just do some calculations here, right? A face detection algorithm, right? The one that crops the face, it takes around like 0 0.2 seconds to detect one face. Uh, no, it's, sorry, it takes 0 0.2 seconds to detect like all the faces in the image. So it doesn't matter one or two or three or four, it just usually it's like 0 0.2 seconds, plus minus a bit. So for our face mask model, right, per face, it takes around 0 0.2 seconds, the one that we built up. Then now we want to calculate the throughput. So we get uh, 0 0.4 seconds per frame. So we just take the inverse of that to get the frames per second. So that's around 2.5 frames per second. But earlier you saw, right, it's not 2.5 frames per second. It's around like five frames per second, right? So you may be wondering how we kind of doubled the expected performance. And actually, right, we didn't run the face detection algorithm every frame. We ran it once every 14 frames. And we used significantly less costly object tracking for the next 13 frames. So let's do more math. Object tracking algorithm takes 0 0.01 second per frame, right? So if you have one frame, you have another frame. If you want to track the object, it just takes 0 0.01 second. Actually, it's way less time than that. But this is just a good uh, you know, estimate for our, uh, for our calculations. So now we want to calculate how long it takes to check and detect for 14 frames. So we take 0 0.2 seconds because on the first frame, we run the face detection. Then on the next 13 frames, we run the face tracking, the object tracking. And then for all the 14 frames, we must run the uh, face mask detection. So it takes 3.13 seconds for 14 frames. And for one frame, we just take 3.13 seconds divided by 14 to get 0 0.224 seconds for one frame. And then our throughput, which be the inverse of that, gives us 4.5 frames per second. And that's pretty cool. It means that we have kind of effectively doubled our detection rate by just adding in a simple object tracking uh, optimization. 
So let's put it a little bit into more in, in perspective here for like in a diagram, right? So we have time to be the x-axis, and then we have the time for phase detection uh, to be this light gray, and time for phase mass detection to be this dark gray. And this blue bar represents one frame. So this is without object tracking. You can count how many frames we have here in a given amount of time. Afterwards, with object tracking, we do the detection on the first frame. Then every subsequent frame, we run our object tracking uh, algorithm, which is actually a correlation filter, uh, and just have this very small slice of time be the time taken to detect uh, to, to track the object. And then we still have to run the mass detection here. So we just sum that too, and then that will be the time taken to process that frame. And then we just multiply it across all the frames. And th this is how many frames we can fit in to a given time. In a given time, if we use a combination of object tracking and uh, face mask detection. So yeah, this is a pretty cool optimization. So maybe you want to detect more people, more than one face, All right? So our current system lacks a lot. It has more than one face. In fact, the slow spread are really proportional to the number of faces. Like 10 frames, right? It's going to take 10 times as long. So we want to stop that. We want to make it faster. Uh, but we need to know why it's slow. And that's because the predictions are happening sequentially. So one fa frame, uh, one face can detect a uh, process at a given time. So then you have to, when one frame is getting processed, the rest have to wait, right? So you can see. So what this guy's face get processed, everything else has to wait. Then after that guy, then after that guy, then the guy. So it's just a sum of all the time because it's one at a time. And we get 0 0.8 seconds for one frame expected to just to do the face mask detection. So this, we can't really have this. Uh, if we have like 100 people, it's going to take infinitely long. So what we can do is actually uh, did, do our mask detection in parallel across multiple cores or even multiple machines. And then we can combine the results and increase our throughput dramatically. So the phase detection remains the same. Okay, We want to isolate all the phases. And then we split the work to multiple cores right, or multiple machines. And each of them take around 0 0.2 seconds to process for phase mass detection. After it's all done, in parallel, we combine the results and give us the results and we can return the results afterwards. So yeah, and then this is this will give us significantly higher throughput for multiple phases. I, as you notice, I put uh, approximately 0 0.2 seconds. That's because there's some overhead involved, uh, uh, some latency. Maybe if you communicate to the network, you send the other phases to networks on other machines, right? There's some there's some latency involved. So it may take slightly longer than 0 0.2 seconds. But overall, it's way more efficient than doing things sequentially. So okay. Other suggestions to optimize for scale and performance. So let's say we, since we are sending a lot of HTTP requests, right? We can say use WebSockets, uh, which is for real-time communication. So we can have uh, the client and the server open a channel, a WebSocket channel, and then they can just pass message to each other. And this will significantly help us reduce the bandwidth usage due to HTTP headers. You can read more about WebSockets uh, on your own, but it's usually used in games or real-time video uh, applications like Zoom. So yeah, and if we had multiple sources of camera feed, multiple machines that run the algorithm, the model, we can use Apache Kafka for efficient distributed event streaming, which is exactly what it's designed for. And we can distribute the workload across multiple machines and then pass the rest of the data back into our Kafka pipeline and our data pipeline for real-time analytics. So one key thing that I would like to point out now is potential improvement. Our model isn't exactly perfect. And the reason is when you put your face, your hand over your face, right? It detects it as a mask. So eh, that's not good. That's not good. People can cheat the system. So I think this is the case because we have a synthetically generated data set. Uh. So uh, one way to actually improve the accuracy is just to have our own data set of people wearing masks, legit masks, so that the system won't get confused. Uh. The model won't get confused and think that a hand is a mask. So yeah. So last but not least, uh, or second last, commercial potential. An idea, you know, you can put this in a system to flag people, employees, not wearing masks, and send their faces to the face recognition system, and then send them an SMS reminder to wear a mask, please. And if they violate it multiple times, then, you know, we, we, we just uh, escalate it to higher ups. Uh. Can be integrated in this kind of system for automatic uh, like discipline checking. And now, last but not least, uh, practical data ethics. 
I find it's a bit relevant to talk about this at the very end uh, so that you guys will remember. And that is uh, about model bias. Uh, we have something known as class imbalance, right? If we have a class imbalance bias towards a certain like race or an ethnicity or group, right? Uh, it may cause, you know, our model be more biased towards these groups and flag them more. And this is actually about uh, model design. Uh. So it's just a reminder that you must kind of design your model properly. So, you know, in the real world, in the industry, when, the, uh, when we have positive samples detected, we're going to feed back these samples into the model and then we're going to retrain the model. And if the model is, keeps getting retrained with bias, uh, you know, bias, uh, positive samples, right? It's going to worsen the class imbalance even more. And then is you know, in the end, it may just, you know, reinforce human prejudice in the real world. Uh, and this is actually something you need to consider in your design phase. Uh, so to, to, to kind of mitigate against class imbalances. So, and that's it. That's a wrap. Uh, we have our workshop GitHub in there. If you have any quick questions, just feel free to post it on the GitHub issues page or send us a YouTube comment and we'll be here for a while. So thanks everyone. Hope you had a good time. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Georgie and Rama. Uh, we have come to the end of our workshop. So great thanks to the both of them who have been working very hard to deliver this uh, workshop to you as best as they can. And I'm sure they were super nervous about presenting. So uh, do shout out your appreciation for them in the chat. Uh, we will really appreciate your feedback on our workshop. Uh, I understand that there's been uh, some issues with regards to the emails. Uh, but um, yeah, do uh, sound out in the feedback on our workshop so that we know how you feel about our workshop. We take the feedback very seriously and uh, aim to improve on all our future workshops to bring you a great experience in our workshops. So as always, the social links, our social links are available below so that you can keep in touch with us and our future activities. We will remain in the chat for the next uh, 10 minutes to address any questions that you may have. Yeah, so Georgie, there are some questions uh, in the chat. Okay, no problem. Um, one sec. Okay. okay. Yeah, maybe you can read out the question. Okay, I will go from the top. Um, okay, 500 internal server error. So time will keep it. Uh, uh, 500 internal server error, I think um, that's usually because you have some, uh, that there's an error thrown in the back end. So it might be because the code is not correct. So you have to let us know uh, what, what kind of, what, what code you've written there. Uh, then we can address it further. Because that's uh, due to a uh, error in the back end. That wasn't, wasn't handled properly. Okay, as for the error about inconsistency of tabs and spaces, um, I'm sorry about that. We're actually using spaces. So if you're using uh, IDE, right, you have to configure the tabs to be spaces and not tabs. Uh, that's that's the uh, that's what's causing it. Uh, because Python's Python's really ain't know about tabs and spaces and spacing and things like that. So you got to uh got to got to convert the tabs to spaces. Sorry. Uh, okay, I am unable to run a pip install our requirements.txt. It is returning a runtime error. Uh, UV oh, does not support Windows. Right, okay. Uh, as I mentioned, are you using Windows command prompt or WSL terminal? Uh, we currently only support WSL terminal because of like, because we don't, because it's uh, quite hard for us to kind of cater the project to command prompt, we don't really have access to it. And the installation instructions should be like super different on there. So we only support WSL right now, I'm sorry. You can find out detailed instructions on how to get it up on our GitHub page. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for post detect error, detector object has no attribute model. Um, once again, that one is most, is perhaps due to the code not being typed correctly. So you gotta let us know what the code looks like, like if on your end in the main.py. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, oh, everything works. Oh, wow, that's great. That's nice. That's good. 500 error post. Okay. Let's see. 
Okay. Um, for that right, uh, is that open CV error is due to the fact that uh, it's getting an image, right? And the image is empty, and so it can't really resize anything. Therefore, it's showing the error. So for that, let me just jump into GitHub. Uh, yeah, let me jump jump into the code. Okay. Um, right, so I think it could be a little bit of an issue with the webcam because I use I also get the error sometimes and it's because the webcam sometimes skips a frame and it sends an empty frame to the back end but it only happened like once or twice for me so I didn't think it was too much of an issue to handle uh, but I guess uh, happening a little bit more frequently uh, I see. Yeah, it, it happens sometimes. I didn't really handle that case uh, that much because it stopped happening for me for some reason. Yeah. If it persists a lot for you, in, you can submit a GitHub issue and I will I will look into it uh, and see if I can you know handle the case where uh, there's an error without breaking the whole application. Uh, alternatively, we could actually just run the front end as uh, in, in the in uh, production mode rather than development mode, which I'll show you in a while. Possible to use further image formatation to overlay. Okay. Right. Okay. First, I will do the front end part. Give me one sec. Oh, you don't have to follow the instructions here. I'm just checking. Uh, okay. So, uh, wait there for your question. Uh, just Control C. Press Control C in your front end server. And then run this. Build the binaries. And then run npm run uh, stuff. I believe. Uh, so this will help, like, kind of not break the application when there's errors, uh, because you're running in production mode. So yeah, hopefully that works for you. As opposed, this is this is as opposed to npm run dev uh, for comparison. Okay, possible to use further image augmentation to overlay non-mass objects, for instance, hands, to improve the model. Well, I mean, technically, that's possible. You can put that in your negative images. That's possible. Uh, I think mean uh, synthetic data generation uh, for that case. Yeah, it's definitely possible. But it's not something we have tried yet uh, due to constraints of time. But I think that's that's something uh, uh, designers will look into if uh, we are building this model for production or uh, where uh, where the cost of actually misclassifying uh, someone not wearing a mask as wearing a mask is pretty costly. No problem. Yeah, so you have any other questions, uh, feel free to let us know so that we can address them about anything at all. Hmm. Okay, we got a question. Uh, uh, thanks for the feedback. Um, Tan Chun Che, could I sidetrack a bit and ask if you guys have any advice for beginners to machine learning on where to start and share about our experiences? Okay. Yeah, I think Georgie and Rama, maybe you all both can share a little bit. Okay, I'll start first. So for machine learning, um, I think it's very important to get the fundamentals right. Uh, you can go two ways. Uh. You can get the fundamentals right first, learn the theory, the theoretical parts of it, then build things. Or you can do the building things first, which is like applying machine learning models as a black box. And then after that, doing the theory. Uh, talk about the theory first. You can probably take a look at uh, uh, Andrew Neng's course, <laughs> Machine Learning by Andrew Neng. Just, just search his name out. He's a big, big, very famous guy. Um, just follow his course, uh, and I think you'll be fine. Uh, there are prerequisites, a bit like linear algebra and calculus. And I think three blue, one brown is a great resource for that. 
He explains math very well, extremely well. So that's for learning the theory. Uh. Just Google Andrew Nung machine learning. And I think from there, you can find a lot of things. Um, as for you know building models and things like that, uh, I think uh, Kaggle is a good resource. Right, if you want to just dive into like data science, machine learning, you just search for Kaggle, just follow their introductory tutorials. Um, or you can look at PyImage search, which is actually where we got inspiration from. Um, PyImage search, it just walks you through the code and teaches you how to build more computer vision related things uh, that you can run on Raspberry Pi on your computer. Uh, that is pretty cool. So, yeah. Um, like from my experience, like if you prefer, a way like um, if you prefer learning not on your own but through classes uh, there are actually many classes that are subsidized by the government for to learn tech skills that are almost 100 percent subsidized for university students so you can google that um the subsidies by imda and you can try out a few classes there machine learning classes yeah Okay, I think uh, it is 8.26 now. So I think thanks so much for joining us all the way to the end of the workshop. Uh, again, uh, thanks so much. Um, uh, please give us feedback so that we know how to make our workshops better for you. And thanks again, Georgie and Rama, for uh, uh, making this workshop, delivering this workshop to everyone. And I hope that you have learned uh, and uh, take away something from this workshop. See you soon in our upcoming events. <laughs>